Um, all right, well, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Marc Andre Pigeon, Marc Andre Pigeon. I am the director of the Canadian Centre for Study Cooperatives. And the topic of today's conversation is governance. Um, and at the Centre, we define governance as who gets to make what decisions and how, right? Very simply, that's the core of governance. And I want to kind of, I, I mentioned this because for too long, I think um, we've excluded Indigenous peoples uh, in profound ways from decision making authority. And I'm flagging this because in part, um, this past Saturday was the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in, Con in Canada, a day that honors Indigenous children who were forced to attend residential schools and reminds us in stark terms that these communities, their families, the parents, their communities were robbed of that autonomy, that governance power. And so this is really fundamental stuff, right? Um, and that, that, that National Day for Truth and Reconciliation also reminds us that we are settlers on this land. Um, and I, in, in saying that, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from Saskatoon, which is in Treaty 6 territory. This is the land of the Cree, the Soto, the Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, Nakota, as well as the traditional homeland of the Métis. So many nations share this space, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land, share in its bounty, reflect on its beauty on a day like today, and reaffirm our shared commitment to the hard and shared work of reconciliation. And I'd be remiss, I'm just gonna close this part of our conversation, this important part of our conversation off by noting that um, it's exciting and well past time to see that we have our first indigenous leader of a provincial government in Manitoba next door. And uh, maybe that's a sign of hope. So, uh, and speaking of governance is very much on topic. So today, somewhat unusually, um, you're gonna hear from me and Stan and we're, we're the featured speakers, right? We're gonna talk a bit about some of the highlights from our second wave of a survey on cooperative governance practices. And I'm gonna set the stage for the research and then Stan is gonna kind of share some of the findings. And then we're gonna break out into groups like all our co-op conversations, we're gonna break out into groups, give everyone an opportunity to kind of socialize, get to know each other, um, and then wrestle with a question that we're gonna to pose to you. Um, if anyone's experiencing technical difficulty along the way, you can flag Natalie. Natalie, can you fly, wave to people? There you are. Um, and she'll help you out. So you can use the chat function. There's Mike, hi Mike. Um, and just be assured that we're going to be recording the session. We are recording the session, uh, and the link will be shared widely after the talk, um, and we'll be mailing that. So by way of introduction, well, I've already introduced myself. I'm the director of the Canadian Centre for Study Cooperatives. Um, rather than kind of dig into my bio, just a little bit of background that's kind of relevant to today's talk. I'm originally from Northern Ontario and an area that falls under what's known as the R R robinson huron Treaty of 1850. So it goes back quite a ways. Um, my relationship to cooperative governance is kind of comes through a channel of experiential channel, I'd say. So I've been on the board of the Cooperative Development Foundation, the Ottawa Renewable Energy Cooperative, the Canadian Association for Studies and Cooperation, the Saskatchewan Cooperative Association, the Center for Excellence in Accounting and Reporting on Cooperatives. And uh, my first experience was in the Jardin Daycare Cooperative that I helped found uh, way back in the early 2000s. Um, I've also had the experience of sitting on the board or around the boardroom table, the Canadian Credit Union Association, and then I've had a, many conversations with cooperative boards uh, all over the place in Canada. So I, I come by this topic, uh, honestly, I guess you can say, and with uh, great interest. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. And I'd also like to introduce now my colleague, Stan. Stan is the Research and Communications Coordinator at the Center for Study, Canadian Center for Study Cooperatives. And Stan has a kind of a deep bench of skills, right? He brings a mixed methods research background. Um, he previously worked at what we now know as CHASER, the Canadian Hub for Applied and Social Research. Um, he worked as a research and evaluation specialist at the Gwyneth, Gwyneth Moss Center for Teaching and Learning, a great USAS institution. Um, and most importantly, from my perspective, uh, Stan also served as a, on the board of the Bridge City Bicycle Cooperative for 10 years. Um, and now is our center's representative on the Saskatchewan Cooperative Association Board of Directors. The findings I'm gonna share with you, or we're gonna share with you today, um, are the outcome of a conversation I had about five years ago with Bob Fink. Uh, Bob is the Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at United Farmers of Alberta, uh, province over. And in one of our early conversations, Bob made an observation and then a suggestion. And the observation was, Mark andre I can't go out anywhere and find a good, public repository of studies <laughs> that would tell me something about how cooperatives are, are governing themselves. What are the practices they're using to govern them? How many govern themselves? How many board members do they have? 
How many of the, how much do their board members get paid? Do they get paid? How often do they re review their governance practices? How big is their board? What's the gender composition of their board? You know, a whole long list of questions that, that we had no good answers for. So in light of that problem, Bob had a suggestion or a proposition, and it was roughly as follows. He observed that every few years, UFA would and, and other cooperatives would pay tens of thousands of dollars to outside consultants to compile, to conduct a really ad hoc survey of governance practices and cooperatives. And he said, what if we instead had the center do a survey, make it widely available, um, shared for free. Anyone who responds to the survey gets access to the gets access to a report and some data. And uh, we just went on with things like that. And so we took them up on that and we got busy. We, we put together a survey in 2019. It was a kind of first go. Uh, Stan's gonna talk to you a little bit about that later on. And then we had a, a kind of formal second wave in 2022. And so we're gonna talk to you about the results from the 2022 survey today. Um, we have a report that's come out with some of those findings. And in the not too distant future, we're gonna do a comparative analysis 2022 versus 2020, 2019. In fact, our aspiration is that over time, we're going to be able to tell stories of the evol evolution of cooperative governance practices, not just point in time stories, but over time stories, right? And so that can kind of help us understand some trends that we want to be mindful of that may be good, maybe less good, um, that can spawn uh, interesting questions. For us at the center, this was not just an opportunity to kind of do something for the sector, but also to create a data repository that would be useful from a research perspective with students who might do a master's degree or a PhD um, and to kind of have a database that we can do fun research things with. So um, one last thing before I turn things over to Stan, uh, I want to acknowledge that today's findings are going to be re re representative of the average or the median values of the totality of the respondents. So over 100 respondents to wave two, we're going to share these kind of summary statistics. They're not always going to be relevant to every credit union, right? Not some credit unions might not see themselves in these. Some cooperatives might not see themselves in the data that we're going to share with you. And that's that's why we built this benchmarking tool to make the data more accessible, more useful, more relevant to cooperatives and credit unions. And Stan's going to talk to you a little bit about the benchmarking tool. But basically, anyone who completes the survey gets access to the tool, they get to pick their peer group, they get to set the relevant comparator, and they get to use that information to govern or think about their board practices. One last thing, sorry, Stan, one more thing I wanna share. You know, I'm having a lot of, I have conversations all the time with cooperative sector, and, and one question that comes up to me, uh, comes up a lot, is Mark andre are you you're concerned about the future of cooperatives, right? There's, there's an angst in the air, um, in credit unions, cooperatives generally, and I want to I want to suggest that the the path through this angst, and it's not terribly unusual for this kind of anxiety to be around, but I think it's acute now. The path to to through this is through good governance. And so I hope and I think that the findings we're going to share with you today are a taste. But they are part of the story, part of the way we're going to get through whatever we're getting, whatever is happening now. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Stan, and he's going to share with you some of the findings from our Wave Two survey. Stan, over to you. Thanks, Marc-Andre, and thanks everyone for uh, coming to our talk today. Um, as Marc-Andre mentioned, this is going to be a uh, conversation between uh, him and I about the study uh, that we at the Centre have been working on uh, since 2019, and uh, I'd be remiss not to thank uh, some of the really key individuals who have helped us along the way, including our research assistants, uh, Aileen Jorge uh, at Zobaku, uh, and previously in 2019, Travis Reynolds, uh, who penned the report uh, that you can also find on our website, uh, as well as the Canadian Hub uh, for Applied and Social Research, uh, who uh, spearheaded collecting the data for us. Um, as a quick anecdote, uh, when I first met Marc Andre, I was working for uh, the Canadian Hub for Applied and Social Research on this particular project. So it was my first introduction to the Canadian Center for the Study of Cooperatives, and uh, it's fun to uh, be uh, on the other side this time around uh, reporting on uh, the findings. 
Mark Andre has already mentioned uh, the big picture goals of the Canadian Cooperative Governance Survey, uh, so I won't get uh, too deep into uh, the context again, um, so that we don't uh, you know, continue to be redundant. But I will say that in 2019, which was the pilot uh, iteration of the survey, we had 26 cooperatives uh, participate. Uh, during the, the last few years, we also had a couple more mini waves, more targeted uh, waves um, to uh, expand the study a bit uh, for um, some uh, the members of the cooperative retailing system uh, at FCL, uh, as an example, um, which is part of those mini waves, uh, but are Wave two, official wave two, started in 2022, and we collected data from June to October, and 114 organizations across Canada participated. So who are these participating organizations? Um, so within the 114, uh, we have uh, the vast majority of organizations are consumer co-ops. Um, almost half uh, work in the retail sector. Um, we have 23% of participating organizations work in the financial sector and 13% in the agricultural sector. Most had operations in Western Canada. So the most, uh, when we asked respondents where your organization had operations, most commonly uh, Saskatchewan, um, Calgary, British Columbia, and Manitoba were mentioned, uh, although we have a healthy representation from Ontario as well. Most also reported that they operated across urban and rural locations. When we look at their assets, uh, revenue, as well as membership base, um, you do see here that uh, the average uh, participating organization uh, is not a startup. Um, we have, uh, a, if we look at just the median, because it's it's quite skewed towards uh, a healthy healthy budget, a healthy asset base, um, we're looking at about 48, um, $48,950,000 uh, for assets and uh, 52, um, 52 million, around 52 million uh, in terms of revenue, uh, 8,500 uh, members, uh, 138 uh, employees. And this for employees that includes part-time, casual and full-time. Uh, in addition, the uh, on average, um, a respondent in the survey has been operating for uh, 75 years. So again, uh, these organizations are typically not new startup co-ops. Um, we have some on the smaller uh, and more medium sized, as you can see when you look at uh, the minimum. Uh, so here we have uh, in this table, anywhere from minimum, which is the lowest value uh, for um, a response to a maximum value. And then we have a spectrum of what was the, in the 25th percentile, uh, the median, which is the middle point of the whole data set uh, and uh, what was in the 75, 75th percentile. So we do have a range, but uh, most commonly um, our respondents were in the larger um, size co-op. So here are some of the survey findings of the uh, wave two survey. The survey is covers a lot of breadth, um, ranging from you know new directors being onboarded. What were some of the strategies uh, to delegates? Uh, what are some of the demographics and compensation practices um, for co-ops with delegates? Uh, how many members participated in the AGM? Um, there a lot. There there's a lot there. So we're just going to go through uh, a few findings uh, for this conversation. Um, some of which were very interesting, uh, including we'll look at uh, board diversity. Um, democratic practices, uh, and uh, as well as uh, director compensation. So uh, just to set the stage, we'll start with those. Then we could talk a bit more about some of the other aspects uh, that we covered. Um, so when we look at board diversity, uh, let's start with age. Here we see that um, the 
most commonly for members of uh, co-ops and credit unions in our sample uh, fall within the 60, uh, age 60 to 69, uh, over about 72% of uh, the directors on the boards were age 50 and up. Uh, and we see that um, about, you know, 10% were uh, under the age of 40. In the midpoint, the median, um, the age was 58. Uh, when we also, in the report, we did some analysis where we could find some data on uh, investor-owned firms just to see if we can compare um, as, as, as concretely as we can what are some of the trends in the um, IOF sector uh, versus uh, the cooperative sector. And we found that uh, in comparison, the median age of board members in IOF, in a typical IOF, uh, was 63. So overall, we're seeing that uh, co-op board members are uh, younger than board members on IOFs. When we look at gender representation, uh, we see here that um, while there is an, uh, a range, um, typically uh, we see that uh, the most common response was about three women uh, on a board. Uh, the average board uh, for a co-op in our sample was nine members. Um, so essentially we're looking at about approximately a third of uh, co-op board um, were, th their directors were women. Uh, again, when we compare it to uh, the corporate world, we see that women comprise an average of 22% uh, on an average corporate board. Um, here, we do also see that the co-op sector tends to have more women on boards than IOFs. When we look at Directors of visible minority status, we see that uh, typically uh, about uh, almost 80% of boards do not have a director uh, of, with visible, uh, of a visible minority. Um, similar uh, numbers were found with regards to um, Indigenous directors. About 80% of uh, co-op boards did not have uh, an, an Indigenous director uh, serving on the board. Um, while this might seem a bit skewed, uh, we do note that um, if we look at the numbers from a population standpoint, uh, it, is, it isn't as skewed as uh, how stark this uh, these two charts look, uh, as well as um, we should note that uh, 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 for visible minority directors, 19% um, we see have one director on, on the board uh, of a visible minority status. Uh, you know, about 20% at least have one or more uh, Indigenous director as well. We also asked about uh, directors um, with uh, living with a disability as well as LGBTQ2 plus uh, directors. Um, here, we do continue to see that uh, the vast majority of organizations in our sample uh, did not have uh, a director um, that fit those two equity deserving communities. So we can conclude that, you know, board diversity uh, continues to be an ongoing conversation. When asked, uh, we did find that uh, over two thirds of organizations in uh, our survey. Oh, uh, apologies there. Um, I may have had this wrong. Uh, I think the uh, the two are flipped. I'm just going to double check. I, I was under the assumption that most had diversity targets. So I'm just going to double check that in the report. Apologies. Uh, no, I, sorry, this does have it right. Um, so a third of organizations did have a diversity target, whereas two thirds of organizations currently do not have diversity targets. Um, when asked, uh, when probed a bit further, uh, we received responses uh, such as the quote below. Um, this is certainly a work in progress. And uh, as we know, um, within, you know, recent uh co-op sector if uh, talks uh, as well as efforts initiatives um, that uh, affect you know the sector wide uh, EDI uh, Jedi are increasingly uh, topics of conversation and efforts are um, ongoing and advancing uh, the topic of board diversity.
Moving on to democratic practices, we also asked uh, respondents to rank in terms of which one of the following entities has the most influence uh, to the least amount of influence on uh, board elections. And we found that overall, uh, the vast majority of respondents said that the membership were the most played the most important role on influencing uh, elections and the management had the were the least important in terms of influencing um elections uh the board was uh, ranked second we also asked how many um directors on average uh, had executive level or same industry experience. And we found that overall, uh, if we look at, again, the midpoint uh, or the average, in this case, uh, they were identical. Um, there were about three uh, directors um, on the board, on a typical board in our sample that had uh, executive level experience. Again, that makes up about a third uh, of an average board. Um, so in, we can say that the, the majority of directors continue to be, um, you know, part of the membership as opposed to uh, organizations just finding um, other executive level uh, experience to serve on the board. Um, and two, uh, average and as well as the midpoint of two, having the same uh, industry uh, experience. Uh, an interesting um, finding uh, that we've noted between um, the two waves uh, at the moment, and we're going to do more work on this in the coming days and weeks, is when we ask about non-member directors. So non-member directors, uh, may have the requisite skill and experience that isn't found within the cooperative's membership. Um, and they are, um, uh, on, then those are individuals, uh, I believe, Mark andre please correct me if I'm wrong, appointed to the board as he's nodding. So he, uh, that's a yes, uh, to give, you know, at times a more impartial um, perspective, uh, especially when it comes to financial conversations that have direct implications to um, to members of which you know directors represents the membership and are part of the membership, so they may have more of a vested interest. However, uh, we do note that uh, with non-member directors, there is risk in um, you know uh, contaminating you know the the cooperative democratic process, if you will. Um, all that being said, when we asked whether organizations, uh, participating organizations had non-member directors on their board. Uh, we found that only 7% said yes. Um, in comparison, in wave one, we actually found 23% of organizations uh, had non-member uh, directors on their board. Um, it'll be interesting. We'll have to dig a bit more into what the differences are uh, and where where uh, the differences come from. Um, currently, our initial thought is that with wave one, we really did uh, hone in on some of the largest uh, cooperatives in Canada, and perhaps uh, there's a size element here, which could explain uh, why in this um, wave two, which has more representation from medium and small size co-ops, um, why there be uh, less here. With regards to board compensation, um, not much to report in, ter in, in terms of trends, uh, not until we dig more deeply into the data. Uh, this is more generally to say that uh, the, there's a lot of variance and it really speaks to um, the different types of organizations that participated in the survey. Uh, and you know they have different financial realities, thus different compensation realities. Um, however, leading to my uh, next point, um, this is where are we're very proud to to um, talk about the benchmarking tool that Mark Andre introduced at the beginning of this conversation, which is uh, our database where um, participating uh, organizations that have participated in the survey can go to and actually select um, the peers that they want to compare their governance practices to. Um, Instead of just talking about it, I'm happy to do a quick demo so that you can see what this tool looks like.
All right, so the tool's just gonna take a second to load. Uh, we have all of the responses from both our waves one and two uh, survey uh, integrated into the tool at the moment. All of the governance practices that I previously talked about, um, you can actually select, you know, organizations that fit within your, whether it's your sector or where you're located, that will help to hone in on providing data that is more specific and less general. So I'm just going to log in with our demonstration organization here. Um, so you're, you're gonna see some data from this organization called Demo Co-op. Of course, this is a, a fake co-op uh, that we created for demonstration purposes and uh, the data there will all be fictitious. However, the peer group data that we will create soon, uh, that is completely real. So here you are, you'll see that when you come down to selecting your peer group, you get to see all of the different types of uh, organizations as well as who participated in both wave one and two. Um, so say for instance, that is uh, the all of the credit unions that generously uh, gave their time to us to participate in the survey. Here are all of the retails for this demonstration purposes. I'll just pick all of the credit unions um, as my peer group. Uh, importantly, uh, for uh, privacy and, and um, not uh, you know anonymity purposes, we do ask that whoever uses this will have to select a minimum of five organizations uh, to maintain some sort of scale and only aggregate information is provided. Folks can also download your report. Um, so these, these are all of your uh, survey responses from the survey, whether it be wave one or wave two, and it has uh, the full gamut of um, what your governance practices are as indicated by your responses on the survey. And on the right-hand side is all of the different survey questions that you can then generate averages. Um, there's also the minimum, the maximum, as well as the midpoint or the median that you can use uh, to review. Our hope is that this helps to inform strategic conversations. It could be a great uh, new director onboarding tool, uh, as well as, uh, of course, um, learning more about you know governance practices of uh, your peers, as well as your own organization. So here, I'm just going to select a few. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, uh, there are questions with regards to CEOs, uh, the equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, stats that I presented earlier, um, term limits, uh, delegates, as I mentioned before. I, two things that we didn't really talk about in the presentation was term limits. So I'll, as a, as a quick demonstration, I'll select term limits as well as number of years served before uh, someone has to run. Uh, for re-election, as well as whether your board uh, conducts um, evaluation, uh, and if so, uh, what type. Once you've selected the categories uh, uh, that you want to um, review, you can download your analysis as a PDF or as an Excel file. I'll just download both really quickly and show you what those reports look like. We will start first with our Excel file. Just take some second here to download. Looks like the Excel is just taking, it was faster than the PDF. So let's start with the Excel. So with the Excel file, you'll have three sheets. The second sheet provides the information of the organizations you added into your peer group. Sheet three then, and I'll expand this so that you can see it a little better. Um, it presents the variable 
what your organization said on the survey, and then uh, some of the statistics that was previously mentioned. So if we look at the first one, does your organization have term limits? Our fake organization said we do. And uh, when we look at the wave two credit unions uh, that participated, 48% said that they also have term limits. 52% said that they don't. Um, the number of years served before needing to run for re-election. Uh, our organization, fictitious organizations at three years. Uh, on average, it's about four. Or if you look at the midpoint, it's three. Um, the Amongst the uh, wave two credit unions, the minimum was two, maximum was 12. And... Uh, here are some of the statistics with regards to whether uh, the your board, as well as your peer groups boards, have a board evaluation process. As well, very quickly, the PDF has exactly the same. Uh, we pro we provide two options for you so that uh, you are able to either use the PDF um, for a, a more glossy version or the Excel, uh, which can then um, conduct additional calculations to be able to uh, manipulate the data uh, for your own organization's purposes. So lastly, some of our takeaways here uh, as, as we've presented um, this these findings uh, is that with regards to IOFs, um, cooperatives uh, are outperforming um, IOFs in terms of female and uh, younger representation on boards. Work needs to be done uh, for other equity deserving groups. Um, diversity targets are a step in the right direction. Um, members consider, continue to exert the most influence on elections, which aligns with cooperative principles. And again, with regards to the dashboard, there's a wealth of information that a general scan may not be able to tease out and uh, more specific sector by sector look uh, might be more useful. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll pass it back to Marc-Andre. All right, thank you, Stan. Uh, so as I mentioned at the outset, uh, the findings that Stan have shared with you, and this is just a small taste of what's available, uh, have been summarized for the cooperative sector in its entirety uh, in a report that uh, we have came out with last week. Stan or Natalie will post the link to that report in the chat. If you wanna take a look at it, we encourage you to do that. Um, so this is the part of this is the part of our event where we want to hear from you, right? We're going to break people out uh, into groups, and we're going to give you a bit of time to socialize because this is not just about us talking to you. We want to hear back from you. We want people to get to know each other. Um, if you find yourself in a group where you don't all know each other, start with some introductions. Who are who are you? Where are you from? Who do you work for? Where who do you study? Where do you study? And what brought you here today? Um, and then we want you to, so after you've kind of gone through that kind of getting to know each other phase of things, we'd like you to ask or answer a question um, that we think could be productive for us as we iterate this survey and evolve it going forward. So the question is as follows, and Stan, I think, or Natalie will post this in chat as well. Based on your experience, what kind of data or information would be useful or have been useful for you in thinking about government pra governance practices and cooperative organizations? And then what kind of data would you like but don't have that could be useful in, in thinking about your governance practices? So those are the questions we, we'd like you to wrestle with in your breakout groups. We're going to kind of give everyone about oh, 12 minutes or so, Natalie, if we can set that up for 12 minutes. So we have a bit of time to regroup and have a shared conversation. So let's, let's do that. Natalie's going to invite you all to join in some breakouts. Oh, I see Mark Andre is not back yet. Oh, there he is. Okay, no, he's sorry. Back. I, I was caught up in the conversation <laughs> in our group. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everyone. We have about ten minutes to uh, to kind of wrap up. I want to, you know, open it up for conversation now. Does anyone have anything they want to share that you know that kind of jumped out at them uh, in, in response to the question we posed? Things that are missing that are found particularly valuable. Uh, who wants to take a shot at this? Uh, Sheldon, you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll start. I took on the recording secretary job. Um, so the, the main benefits, are two of the things are diversity targets and, and for succession and stuff to share those inf that information is useful. The remuneration piece, of course, is uh, our group found useful. Um, what I thought uh, would be helpful 
would be uh, information on stakeholder engagement, share, sharing that, what people are doing differently and for, as, as far as their suppliers, their, the community, the membership, those types of things, like what kind of stakeholder engagement looks like. And then uh, meeting times information, people are looking for, you know, do you meet during the workday, after work, uh, length of the meetings, um, those types of things as far as in uh, making uh, board meetings accessible and committee meetings accessible, what people's experiences are. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll just echo a little bit of that because we heard some some similar things in our group. The, the member engagement, stakeholder engagement was a theme that came up in our, our discussion group and um, uh, sharing practices around that. And one, one other thing in our group that I'll just flag before I pass it back out to the group was uh, the, the hiring of a CEO process. Like what are boards, what do boards look like? What do they, what kind of processes do they undertake to do that? And then evaluating the CEO, what does that look like? Um, some of the practices again, less about the salary per se, but more about um, what those practices look like. So that was, I thought that was really interesting. Um, anyone else want to uh, throw something on the table? Other ideas or other conversations that happened that maybe aren't related to our question specifically? Well, we had some conversation around things that we would have liked to see. Um, some of those being like qualifications for the different. Uh, directors experiences their their average length of 10 years um, and as well as like board performance assessment how were they rating and then how would that assessment feed into the performance of the overall organization was there a correlation around how well the board performed to how well that organization performed yeah boy that's a fun question but also really big <laughs> but I, I love that that'd be really great to dig into uh, thanks for sharing that, Kim. Uh, Andrew, I see you have your hand up. Let's go with you next. One thing that I raised that I would very much like to see in, in future data is some of the um, like more nuanced data on nominations and elections processes that are larger, well, that all cooperatives go through, but particularly our, our larger ones. And, and for me, it's the practice of um, the board recommending candidates and its impact on election results. I think it would be interesting uh, to see um, uh, certainly a practice that I've seen more and more. And if, the reason I bring it up is I, I forget what the data point was, but the view of members impact on elections or governance and right. how that negatively or positively impacts um, their engagement. Yeah, one thing we didn't flag in this presentation, but that's a little more teased out in the report is this um, contested elections, like how many uh, how many of the openings are actually competitive. And it's a it's a relatively I don't remember quite the data point stand, but it's not it's not very big. There's a lot of uncontested uh, elections. And we kind of pose that as a bit of a agreed of a, a dilemma a little bit. On the one hand, members are apparently influential. But on the other hand, most or many anyway elections are actually just um you know acclaimed in some way um so so there's a bit of a tension there that yeah that'd be really interesting to dig into anyone else uh, want to throw something on the table and maybe we'll, we'll i see a comment in the chat so i'm gonna go and check that out oh that's just natalie um <laughs> anything else uh people want to share go ahead uh Clo Marie. It would be useful to see a breakdown of cooperative practices across Canada's 10 broad occupational groups. Um, if I'm 32, I wouldn't know anything about starting a food cop because that information is not available. Mm -hmm. There's no way to correspond like how to create a co-op to fill a policy need. There's There's a lack of connectivity. It sounds like a great idea, but when you try to bring this to minority communities, there's no connection because there's no Canadian data. Okay. So making sure it's in layman terms, making sure that it connects to culturally relevant practices, and also making sure that it's like sector specific would be really useful to modernizing governance. Hmm. Gen Z and millennials govern themselves differently, but cooperatively, they could be solving problems. It's just the practices are stuck in an ivory tower. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there, I think we had someone for co-ops first year, Kyle. I thought I saw Kyle 
on here at some point. Uh, too many names for me to digest right now. But they they do a lot of work in this space, uh, or increasingly in in the kind of diversity space as well. But uh, I think you might want to check them out. I don't know if we have good data though that kind of address your question specifically. Um, but that is a place to kind of take a, a first crack at this and, and feel free to reach out to them for guidance. Um, is there anything else? Maybe I'll I'll kind of wrap things up here. Um, we're just about at new at our time, concluding time. Um, I'll just uh, let me just kind of get to my notes here. And yes, yeah, so well, thank you, I guess, is what I want to say for participating in this conversation. Our next conversation is going to be on Wednesday, November 1st. It's always the first Wednesday of every month. Um, our speaker will be Sean Goby, an associate professor and co-director of the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. Um, we'll be sharing the registration for his talk very shortly. Um, folks living in Saskatoon or near Saskatoon, um, we want to invite you to take part in an event we're hosting in, what, two weeks from now, roughly? Um, as part of Co-op Week, we're hosting a launch of Dr. Dion Poehler's um, a book, a uh, book, uh, a co-edited volume called Building Inclusive Communities in Rural Canada. And uh, Dr. Poehler is a professor in the Edwards School of Business here at the University of Saskatchewan. And she's going to be talking specifically about a chapter in that book that concerns uh, the Co-op Innovation Project. This was a project funded by Federated Cooperatives uh, on behalf of the CRS, Cooperative Retailing System. And it, it was in some ways the genesis or the catalyst to creating cooperatives first. So we're really excited about this um, this talk. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, interesting. We're going to have a little social afterwards. So we'd encourage you to join us. This is on October 17th, 4.30 p.m. at the Diefenbaker Canada Centre. And if you're interested, Natalie's going to put a link up to the registration in our chat. Um, and with that, I want to thank you all again for taking time to attend our co-op conversation today. Um, we look forward to engaging with you future and uh, have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone.